Képzeljétek el, hogy milyen nehéz lehet megvédeni egy teljes államot. Pláne akkor, hogy ez az állam, ez a világ legnagyobb, vagy egyik legnagyobb gazdasági hatalma, és különösen akkor, hogyha annyi mindenki akarja megtámadni. Én azt gondolom, hogy ezt a legautentikusabb embertől fogjuk most megtudni, hogy milyen érzés megvédeni egy ilyen rendszert. Az illető 20 éve különleges ügynök az FBI kötelékében küzdött a drogok és a fegyveres bűnözés ellen, volt fedett ügynök is egyébként, volt tagja SWAT teamnek, és most már magasrangú vezetőként az FBI kibervédelmi területének az egyik igazgatója. Kérnék egy nagyon nagy tapsot, Mr. Donald Goodnak. Thank you, Arthur, and good morning. It's a pleasure to be here this morning, and a great turnout. So I appreciate everyone coming. Let me just take a minute uh, before I get started to give you a little bit of context of, of who I am and where I fit within the FBI. And I'd also like to ask you to make this interactive. I don't know how comfortable people feel asking questions, but um, I'm certainly willing to take questions throughout the presentation, so please feel comfortable asking. So I'm the Deputy Assistant Director within the FBI Cyber Division back in Washington, D.C. I have responsibility for um, our cyber program throughout the Bureau, actually throughout the United States, throughout the world, and have a number of different people at headquarters that help support that mission, from operational people to intelligence people to a full complement of technical people that can do the work. And then we have a full complement of special agents and technical people in the field that also uh, serve to Uh, work that mission, if you will. So here's what I'd like to talk a little bit about today. Uh, and I just came, I was in Germany for a day or two, and one of the things that I've, I've found is that no matter where we go in the world, no matter who we talk to, when it comes to cyber and cybersecurity and some of the threats that are faced, everyone really faces the same threats. So the problem is, is not unique to any one particular area of the world. It really is the same, it may be more intense, or more severe in a particular area of the world, but for the most part, people face the same threats. And so that's one of the things that I'd like everyone to keep in mind today as I speak. And what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about the FBI's mission, what we do. I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I call lanes in the road and our responsibilities. So I'm sure many of you have heard about DHS and NSA and some of the other different agencies out there. I'll talk a little bit about uh, how we fit with them and how we work with them. I'll also talk about how we're structured as an organization to combat the cyber threat. I'll talk about the threat itself, what we see out there when we're going out and conducting investigations and gathering intelligence. I'm also going to talk about uh, our engagement with the private sector. One of the things I always say is that cyber is a relationships business. In order to be successful working cyber matters, investigating cyber crimes, you have to have a very good relationship with the private sector. People have to trust you. They have to want to work with you. And then the other thing that I'll touch on is a couple different cases that we've worked in the last few years, which have been significant cases with some worldwide implications. And then I'll, I'll wrap up by talking a little bit about incident response. So what you would see the Bureau, how the Bureau would handle a, a major cyber situation if we had to respond to one, and I'd also leave you with a few takeaways. So probably uh, about 30 minutes, and with that, let me, let me get started. So I, I put our, our mission slide up for a couple reasons. There are a few things I always like to, to mention. One is that we talk about global U.S. interests. Really, as I mentioned at the outset, cyber is a global problem. Everybody faces it. Uh, numerous challenges, it doesn't matter whether you're in Hungary, whether you're in the United States, whether you're in Germany, everybody's faced with it. And so it's a global threat, global challenge. We all need to work together in order to be effective to combat it. We talk about collaborative partnerships, and as I mentioned, relationships are extremely important when it comes to working cyber. You really have to have some very, very good relationships, not only with your partners, meaning other federal partners for us in the United States, So some of the other folks who work those crimes, but also our state and local police, because they, they play a role in it as well, as well as other federal agencies. 
But perhaps most importantly, you need to have strong relationships with the private sector, with the businesses that we go into and that we meet with and that we try assist when they've been breached or when they've been compromised. And then also our authorities. So what do we do? What do we have responsibility for in cyber? What does the FBI bring to the table? So we can investigate not only criminal matters, but we also have national security authorities, which means you know, we can handle your traditional criminal work. So for example, uh, if it's just a, a, a very basic hack uh, where we believe uh, a criminal would be responsible, say, for hacking a bank, or we can also go ahead and investigate crimes where a nation state would be behind it. So where you might have a government who's targeting the United States and coming in and trying to steal information or trying to steal some of our intellectual property. So that's, uh, that's our mission. I talked about, I mentioned lanes in the road and roles and responsibilities. So the FBI is responsible for investigations, attribution, disruption, and prosecution. So at the end of the day, we like to put people in jail if we can do it. But we can't always do it because of the, the work that we're doing. It's difficult in cyber. So sometimes the best that we can hope for is to be able to go out and disrupt a criminal organization, maybe make it difficult for them to temporarily do or not be able to do what they're doing, to go in and, and steal from a company. DHS, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, it's Department of Homeland Security in the United States. They have responsibility for protection and for remediation. So oftentimes we're on the ground together with them as we're investigating the crime. They're in there trying to work with the, the victim to go ahead and get things back on track with their system and remediate or fix the problem that the folks uh, had based on the breach. And then DOD and NSA are the National Security Industry, or, uh, uh, National Security Agency, excuse me, they have responsibility for the national defense. So protecting protecting us from, from cyber warfare. Talk a little bit about our structure and how we think about cyber and what we think is important to be effective when dealing with the, the criminal element or the nation state actor when it comes to, to cyber crime. We're headquartered, as you know, in Washington, D.C., but we also have a couple other locations, and at one of our other locations in the D.C. area, we have what we call our National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force. I talked about the importance of partnership and how we all need to work together because this is such a significant problem, such a significant crime. So in our Chantilly, Virginia area, we have the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force, or as we call it, the NCIJTF. It's made up of 24 different agencies. The purpose of this organization is to bring all these different agencies together. So it would be like bringing all the law enforcement together that you have in Hungary and perhaps even some of the surrounding companies, maybe at the, at the state level, perhaps at the national level, and getting everyone together for the purpose of coordinating, integrating, sharing cyber intelligence as well as cyber investigative threat information. So it's really a, um, a very sophisticated information sharing body that allows us to exchange information, whether we're seeking intelligence or we're in the process of conducting a major investigation. I put this up because a lot of people don't realize the presence that FBI has across the world. We are in 68 different countries throughout the world. So while we have 13,000 special agents, and many of those special agents reside in the United States. We have 56 field offices in the United States and then a number of other smaller satellite offices. We're resident in 68 different countries. So for example, here in Budapest, we have a, a special agent who runs our office who has responsibility for working with the local authorities, investigating crimes that the FBI would normally have, have jurisdiction over, and then also assisting your law enforcement with the investigation of certain crimes. What we did with cyber, because cyber is such a significant threat, is we took a look at across the world, and we realized that there are a number of areas that are what we consider to be high threat cyber areas, where there's a significant amount of cyber activity, criminal activity, criminal actors, nation state actors, and we deployed special agents to those areas. So in 22 of the 68 countries, we actually have special agents who are specifically trained, specially trained in cyber investigations, and we've deployed them to those areas. One of the things it's allowed us to do, it's allowed us to develop better relationships with the, the locals. 
also to share more information, uh, develop programs, build capacity, as you can see on the slide, and just really enhance our ability to come at this threat on a, uh, from, a global, from a global standpoint. So it's been very effective. The program continues to expand, and uh, we're going to be looking at probably adding a few more offices throughout the year. I mentioned domestically, and I'll just touch on this very briefly, but we have 56 field offices in the United States. In each of our field offices, and again, this is kind of how we approach cyber, and I think a lot of what we do, frankly, is applicable across the globe, maybe not to the scale we do it because of the resources that we have, but I think a lot of the things that we do to go after the cyber threat or against the cyber threat are really applicable uh, to other parts of the world. We have the 56 field offices. In each field office, we have a cyber task force. And those cyber task forces are made up of special agents who are trained in cyber, highly skilled in cyber. They go through a complete curriculum in the Bureau. And in addition to that, many of them have private sector experience. So they've come to us from the private sector and they've had jobs where they've been software developers or they've been sysadmins or they've been network administrators. They come to us, they become special agents, they go through the training. They reside on those task forces along with computer scientists who do a lot of our very technical or malware work, some of the reverse engineering. We have intelligence analysts who are also trained in cyber, many of whom have a, a cyber background. And then many times in these field offices, we will have state and local law enforcement joining us who have cyber background as well. We come together to form a task force. And I know you're familiar with that concept because I know we've got a, uh, I know we have an organized crime task force here uh, in the country. So it really puts us in a very, very good position to investigate these crimes and actually go after people who, who perpetrate uh, cyber crimes. So let me talk a little bit about the threat and how we think about and how we see the threat. And this is based on a lot of the work that we've done, not only in the United States, but also throughout the world. And a lot of the work that we've also done with our partners throughout the world. Many of you are probably familiar with this. This is what we call the cyber kill chain. And essentially what it shows is how someone gains access to a system, how, to a network, and how they remain in that network, how they reside in that network over a period of time. So starting with the initial reconnaissance. And if you'll note, we talk about there's graphics depicting uh, Google+, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. One of the things that we found is that a lot of the reconnaissance when people are going in to conduct a hack is done through social media. You know, if they're looking to target somebody, specifically target somebody, we're still seeing that spear phishing is a very, very common means to gain access to the company. So what will happen is you'll have a, a bad actor or a criminal actually do some research, determine who works at a particular company. That person may be out on social media. They'll gather whatever information they can from that particular individual, find out where that person works. Uh, what that person does, learn as much as they possibly can, and of, oftentimes through that reconnaissance, they're able to find the person's company, put together a, a spear phishing email, maybe they're using something like Gmail or Yahoo or one of the other email systems, work their way into the company, establish a foothold in the company, and then go in and actually uh, be able to exfiltrate data and remain in the system for a period of time. And you'll note that where the, the loop is, one of the things that we're trying to show there is that not only do people target a particular area in the company, but what we find is sometimes they get in there and they go ahead and they're able to escalate their privileges, meaning gain more access to other systems while they're in there, maybe gain admin rights or another elevated user's rights, and then move from one spot in the company all the way across the company so that they're able to do a lot more damage and, uh, and take a lot more data. Typically, uh, what we find based on some of the work that we do is when someone gets into the network or someone gets into the system, they may remain in there for six to eight months undetected before anyone realizes that they're actually in there. So while they're in there, they're actually they're stealing a lot of information, gathering a lot of data. So who's doing the hacking? How do we categorize the people who are behind the keyboard, if you will, doing the hacking, actually perpetrating the crime? This is the continuum that we use with uh, the six different categories, anything from a, a hacktivist, so that would be a person who has a political or a social cause to advance, to the criminal who is actually stealing information in order to monetize that information and make money off of it. So in other words, people stealing uh, credit card information, 
you know, if you read in the paper and you see where some of the, um, some of the different retail outlets, we've had it in the U.S., and I'm sure you've seen some things here where uh, places like Target, Home Depot, those type of places uh, have been targeted. Credit card information is taken, and then the criminal takes that information and sells that information to make money on the dark web or on the underground web. And one of the things we always say in the Bureau is it's all about the money. Typically, most people are in this business, many of them are in business to make money, and so they'll do it by stealing information. The insider threat, where you have someone in your organization or your company, for whatever, for whatever reason, that person has, a, um, has determined that he or she wants to steal information from the company. The person may be an employee of the company, maybe a contractor with the company, gains access to a system, steals that information by having the access that he or she has, sells that information, or somehow uses that information to do harm to the company, or may in fact be working for the company and may be committing espionage, may be providing that information uh, to a foreign government for purposes of, um, of espionage. Terrorism, uh, we're starting to see the, the terrorist threat go, so the, the or grow rather, excuse me, the traditional way in which terrorists work and some of the overt things that you see with the bombings and the, and, the, and the murders and things like that, the terrorists are also making use of the internet. And they're doing it for a couple reasons. They're using it to plan their operations, so communicating between themselves. Um, they're posting some things. Recently in the United States, we had an issue, uh, a situation where terrorists were actually posting uh, the names of military and of law enforcement officials and actually putting out a kill list, if you will, for people to go out and do harm to law enforcement and to, uh, and to some government officials as well. And so that's become more and more, um, more, and more of a problem for us. We're also seeing that ter the terrorist capability is growing. So at some point, as they continue to educate themselves, they may in fact be a more formidable force and may be in a position uh, where they can cause more significant harm and perhaps uh, target critical infrastructure. And by that I mean maybe going after a power grid maybe going after a, um, a water treatment plant, something like that. And then cyber warfare, which would be all out cyber war, which hopefully we will, uh, we will never see. One of the trends that we're seeing in the United States, I don't know if you're seeing it here, some of, this is, some of it's global, it really depends on the region of the world, is we're seeing a significant problem with companies that hold a lot of personally identifiable information being targeted by the criminal actors, by the bad actors. Could be nation states, could be just the traditional criminal, but we've seen it recently where we've had a rash of breaches with healthcare providers, healthcare companies, where they hold a lot of information based on the fact that they provide, um, they provide insurance and other services to people. And so what ends up happening, someone gets in and exfiltrates or pulls out all that information. Uh, we recently, our Office of Personnel Management, which holds all of our government records for all of our government employees, was breached, and there was a tremendous amount of information taken, which may be taken for uh, perhaps financial gain. It could be taken for uh, a foreign government to go ahead and, and target folks within the U.S., but we're seeing that as a, uh, as a big trend right now. Not sure if you're seeing any of that here. I just want to touch a little bit on, I talked about relationships and the importance of relationships. And we really feel, as I said, that in order to be successful in this area, combating the nation state threat as well as the criminals, you've got to have good relationships. So you've got to have, first and foremost, you have to have good relationships with the private sector, with companies that many of you represent. Uh, we need to feel, have people feel comfortable that they can trust the FBI that they can pick up the phone, that they can call us, that they can have a relationship with us, and that we're gonna do the right thing. And we need to be able to share information. So us sharing to them, providing them with threat information so they know what they can do to harden their networks, to harden their systems, to protect themselves, and then also them sharing information with us so that we have a better understanding of what's occurring so that we can do a better job on the law enforcement side. We spend a significant amount of time working with the private sector, providing them with specialized briefings. So if you're in the healthcare sector, bringing folks in from the healthcare sector and advising them on what we see as some of the most significant threats and how they might be able to better protect themselves. We do it with the financial services sector. So banking and finance, bringing them in and explaining to them, 
you know, you could be subject to a DDoS attack or we see a threat coming from here or a threat coming from there. We do that on a regular basis. Uh, and the reason for that, again, is to enhance that relationship and build that trust. A lot of those briefings occur in the field with our field offices, but then we also uh, work directly from FBI headquarters where we put those briefings together and we civets them out or video broadcast them out to a number of people uh, throughout the country. We spend a lot of time working with our government as well, so with our Congress and with the White House. And the reason that we do that is because everything that we do, we have to be able to answer to our government for. So we're given certain authorities by our government. We're also given funding by our government. And it's important for our congressmen, our senators, and also for the president to understand what it is that we do and how we do it, why we do it, what we need in order to be successful with our mission. So we spend a significant amount of time doing that as well and informing them, keeping them up to date on exactly what it is that we do and, and why we do it. And then we also do some other specialized things. Uh, for example, uh, we do tabletop exercises. Some of you may be familiar with those here. You may do them in your own companies where we actually exercise or practice, kind of do walkthroughs of what we would do, how we would respond to a major cyber breach or a major cyber incident. So the Grid X is something that's affiliated with the energy sector. Hamilton Vault is affiliated with the financial sector. These are major exercises where we bring people together, not just from the FBI, but from all the different agencies that would respond to a major breach like this. We get them together. We get our executives in the room, we get the, the middle managers in the room, and we kind of walk through what would happen if a major breach occurred, how, we were, how, we, we, uh, how would we handle it, how would we respond to it. I mentioned the briefings. Uh, healthcare and public health has been a, a big area for us as of late. And then a couple other specialized things that we've done recently, just in the last week, uh, we had 30 different chief information security officers come into our FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. And what we did, and this is the first time that we've done that, is we actually put them through kind of a mini FBI academy where we went ahead and not only did we give them updates on cyber and threat briefings on cyber, but we gave them an opportunity to shoot and to experience some of the other things that an FBI agent would normally experience during his or her training. And we did that in a way to kind of open the curtain a little bit, demystify the FBI, kind of what we do, how we do it, and to enhance the relationship between ourselves and between them. We actually got, um, got some great feedback on it. Worked out very, very well for us. And then the only other thing I would mention would be InfraGuard. InfraGuard is a uh, information sharing program that we have uh, across the country. It's a domestic only program in the United States, but it has 35,000 members. Uh, members have access to a secure portal where they get all the latest and greatest threat information that we can put out there to them on cyber threats. And then people meet on a regular basis. The different chapters throughout the country meet on a regular basis. And they're able to share information in person. And so what we do, what I always say is, you know, it's member to member sharing. So you might be in the banking sector, but you're sharing cyber threat information from someone who's in the healthcare sector, for example, or someone who's in the transportation sector. And it stimulates conversation, stimulates information sharing. Again, we share with them, they share with us. But then industry to industry sharing is extremely important as well so that folks can learn from one another and get out in front of the threat. And then we also have um, the National Cyber Forensics Training Alliance, which is based out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it's a, uh, it's a nonprofit information sharing organization, if you will. It's made up of a number of different companies, not only domestic companies, but also we've got some folks from overseas who are participating in, in it as well. It's an unclassified environment where you can share cyber threat information and um, hopefully learn how to better protect your networks and better protect your systems. Because of all the outreach work that we do, we have to prioritize what we do. We have limited resources. Uh, we do not have infinite resources like everyone else. We're challenged. And so we've got to take a look at what we consider to be the, the industries or the sectors that might be subject to the greatest number of cyber attacks. And prioritize and work with them first. So you can see on the slide how we tier it out. Tier one would be the most significant. So from healthcare to energy, information technology, communication, banking, those are the sectors we believe are subject to the greatest risk by people committing cyber crimes. And so that's where we spend a significant amount of our time doing the outreach work. 
and then tier two, defense, transportation, government, materials and waste, and then tier three. Now this is outreach only. If there's a crime, if something's, uh, if there's a breach, a compromise, we're gonna go to wherever we have to. There's no tiering there. So we're gonna respond to any breach or any compromise. It doesn't matter the sector. The response is gonna be identical. Whatever we need to do to properly respond to that breach, we will. We also share a lot of written information. I'll go through these very quickly. But um, to give you an idea, one of the things that people from the private sector asked us for was they said, hey, it's great that you bring us in and that you do threat briefings for us and you share the information, but is there something that you can get out to us on a regular basis that will keep us well informed and let us know exactly what's occurring with respect to cyber and some of the different threats? So one of the things we do is we generate what we call a private industry notification or a PIN, which provides some specific information on different things that we see. So it might be a, uh, might be a particular strain of malware. It might be a, a particular indicator that we see out there that's significant that we think the private sector should know about. And we disseminate that automatically. So no one has to ask for it. So we simply push it out to people that we're working with and that we have a relationship. We send a number of these out every year, every week, frankly. Sometimes they're done jointly with some of our other partners like the Secret Service or DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. But these go out on a fairly regular basis, normally actionable intelligence, but unclassified. We also send out what we call an FBI flash, which is normally more technical in nature. And it may, for example, provide a, a range of IPs, which we've determined to be uh, associated with a nefarious actor or with a bad guy or other indicators of compromise that we think it's significant that the industry know about so that they can protect themselves, they know what to look for on their networks, who might be trying to gain access. And sometimes this information comes very quickly. So we might be on the ground responding to an incident, to a major breach, and what ends up happening is we see some things while we're responding to that breach that we think might be helpful. Some of the bad things that we see might be helpful to other people in that particular sector or in maybe several sectors. And so we'll anonymize that information, no attribution to the victim whatsoever, but anonymize that information and get that out to the private sector so that we can help them get out in front of things. And then occasionally we'll also do um, what we call joint advisory bulletins. So these are bulletins that would be with another agency, another law enforcement agency. So this one, I believe, is with the United States Department of uh, U.S. Treasury and also a uh, private sector organization. Uh, in the United States, we have what we call information sharing and analysis centers. And normally, they're for all the sectors. So we have one for finance. We have one for transportation. We have one for, uh, for the airlines. There are a number of different ones out there. And we will work closely with them. They kind of represent that sector or that industry. They provide information back and forth to people in that industry, and oftentimes we'll partner with them when we're sending some of this information out. Just wanted to touch briefly on a couple cases, and these are both cases I'll talk about are criminal cases. So they are, they are not nation state cases, but criminal cases. This was one, uh, this individual, Bogachev, was responsible for the development of the Zeus banking trojan, which I'm sure probably a number of you are familiar with, as well as the CryptoLock or the ransomware software, where your computer would be locked up or your system would be locked up, and the only way to unlock it would be to go ahead and, um, and provide money or pay to have it locked. Basically, your computer was held hostage. So we indicted him actually last year. He was responsible for tens of millions of dollars in losses. Um, still looking for him uh, on one of the, uh, one of the FBI's uh, most wanted cyber criminals. So not on our top 10 list, but one of our most wanted cyber criminals. We've actually posted a $3 million reward, which is really unprecedented when, when it comes to cyber. We haven't done that in the past. That's the first time that we ever did it. So this was a very significant case for us, and we're still continuing to, um, to work the case. And then recently in July, uh, we did a, a significant takedown of people who were associated with uh, the, the Dark Code Forum, which is one of the underground web forums, one of the dark web forums, where people could go online, you can buy zero-day exploits, malware, hackers for hire, a number of different things that you could buy to help perpetrate hacking crimes, uh, computer crimes, breaches. 
And what's significant about this, and the reason I wanted to highlight this, was the fact that we work with people throughout the world. This is one of those cases where we had cooperation from 19 other countries. We arrested 28 people, executed 37 search warrants. So a very, very significant case for us. And probably in the years I've been in and out of cyber, and I've worked cyber, probably the most significant case as far as worldwide cooperation or global cooperation. And that's one of the things that you know, I mentioned early on, how important that is to have that cooperation across the globe to be able to be effective when you're going against these criminals. I want to touch briefly on incident response and some of the different things that we suggest, some of the different things that we look for or people should think about. And that's really, I'm hoping today that when I leave, when I finish, that I've given you a few things to think about that you can kind of take away from here. But these are some of the different things that we suggest or that we, we look for when we're talking to folks when we go out and respond to a breach. For example, having a legal banner or a computer user agreement that says specifically what you as an employee or what your employees can use the computer at work for so that it's specific, it's business, it's not for personal use. Uh, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do. And it's important because for us in the United States, if we actually want to arrest somebody, we want to prosecute somebody, they've got to be, obviously, they've got to be breaking a the law, they've got to do something wrong. In this instance, it makes it very clear you're not to use the, the computer to engage in this type of activity. You have no expectation of privacy when you're on the work computer, even though we value privacy. When you're using the business computer, the business owns the computer or the network. Network topography maps, very helpful to have your network mapped out so that if we respond or you have to respond, even if you don't call law enforcement, you have to respond to some type of major cyber incident that you have internally, that you know what your network looks like, that you're not guessing, that you know where to go, where your systems are, how everything's interconnected, very important. Do you do any logging? Do you do security logs, host logs, uh, IDS logs? It's expensive to maintain some of that information because it takes hard disk space, but do you know who's doing what and where they are in your systems and in your networks at any given time? It's important to have that turned on because without that, you can't trace what people are doing. If you need to trace what people are doing or what's happened, it's very, very helpful. Do you archive network traffic? so you know what's traversing your network and when it's traversing your network and are you doing that on a regular basis? Again, something that, that needs to be done. Proper access control. What we mean by that is how many people need to have sysadmin rights on your systems? How many people need to have what we call elevated privileges? So realistically, in a perfect world, people should have access only to the information they need to do to do their job. They should not be able to, to traverse the network or your systems and go from uh, system to system with impunity. They should be restricted to accessing, being able to access the data and the systems and the networks that they need specifically to do their job, and that's it. Only a few people should have sysadmin rights, not everyone. And so frequently we, we find situations where people haven't thought about that, and people can get on a network and can go almost anywhere and get access to any kind of information that they want. Operations continuity plan thinking about what are we going to do if something bad happens? How are we going to continue running our business? Uh, are we going to have to shut down? Is it going to put us out of business? A great example, and there was just an article, so I'm not sharing anything that's not public. There was just an article in the Harvard Business Review about what happened to Sony. And everybody knows, I think, what happened to Sony Pictures Entertainment when North Korea came in and basically shut them down. There's a, uh, an interview with the CEO of Sony who talks about how they actually had to go back to doing business the way they did business before they really had computers. They had no email, they had no networks, they couldn't do anything. They were literally shut down for a number of weeks. It cost the company literally millions and millions of dollars just to pay people. They had to go back to old payroll equipment. So it's the kind of thing that you want to think about if something bad happened at my company or an organization I work with or an organization I consult to, how would that company recover from it? How would they respond to it? And then disaster recovery procedures, which kind of go hand in hand. If something bad happens, you know, whether it be a natural disaster or, God forbid, a, a very bad breach, what do we do from, to recover from that? If we lose everything, how do we start over again? What do we do when we respond? And probably some of this is similar to what all of you do or what you could expect here, I would, I would think, something similar, maybe not to the, the extent that we have. But we use the NCI JTF I mentioned earlier. 
which is the organization that has the 24 partners, combination of FBI, uh, NASA, NSA, Air Force, OSI, a number of different agencies in there that are set up to provide and share information to one another. So trying to work and figure out exactly what happened, that's a great resource for us. Uh, just to be able to go in and frankly go into our databases and take a look at some of the information we've had on, uh, on past breaches. And then we have a cyber action team, which is kind of like a cyber SWAT team. So when something bad happens, we take our best and brightest people from across the country and in some instances people who are deployed overseas and bring them in to work on that particular breach or that particular compromise. So when we had the OPM breach, we actually pulled our cyber action team in to do the investigative work on that breach. To become a member of that team, it's not just good enough to be a cyber FBI agent. You have to be a highly skilled cyber FBI agent. You go through some very specialized testing, pretty rigorous. You have to be able to pass the test and keep up with a certain level of training in order to be part of that, part of that unique uh, group, if you will. And then all of our offices have a computer analysis and response team which is actually our forensics team. So all of our offices throughout the country are equipped to do forensic work. And not only on pure cyber cases, but they also do that forensic work on other cases as well. So of course we work counterterrorism, counterintelligence, pure criminal. We have about 200 and different, 280 different violations that we investigate. Our computer analysis response team assists in many of those. Uh, today we find cyber everywhere. It doesn't matter whether it's a Hells Angels motorcycle gang case, it's a drug enterprise case, it's a pure cyber case, it's a counterintelligence case. Cyber touches everything the FBI does, and so we have to be well positioned to be able to respond to it when something bad happens. And so these three, these three entities would have a, um, a very active role along with the field, the local field office that would be responsible for it. Just some things to leave you with to kind of sum up. Uh, one of the things that I mention when I go out and I talk to people all the time is what the threat environment is like today, how different it is. I was away from cyber for about 18 months. I had another assignment in the FBI. I came back to cyber, and in just that short time, 18 months, the threat has become infinitely more complex, a lot more dynamic. This is probably the most difficult, the most challenging threat that we face. And not only we, when I say the U.S., but I mean we as a, as a world, worldwide. It's an extremely difficult threat. You're dealing with a highly complex, very sophisticated group of people uh, who move very quickly, and uh, they work very hard at doing the wrong thing all day, and they're very smart at it, they're very good at it. So very, very difficult, very, very challenging to work these cases. Uh, security controls and patching, I mentioned that this earlier about doing the right things, thinking about how you secure your systems, how you secure your networks to ensure that you're doing the right thing to make sure that they're as resilient, they're as hardened as they can be. It's not to say there are any guarantees, I think probably pretty much it's not a question of if you'll be hacked, it's more so when you'll be hacked. That's really the way it, it seems to work these days. But just thinking about privileges users have, are you doing the right things to patch your systems, keep antivirus up to date, do you know what's on your network, do you know who's on your network, do you know who's accessing which system. Speed matters when something bad happens, you have to be able to respond to it. You have to be able to do it quickly. Uh, you certainly don't want to have someone in your system for month upon month. If you find something, you need to contact law enforcement or you need to have a relationship with somebody who can come in and help you with it. Relationships and trust. I mentioned trusted relationships. I can't say enough about that. That's probably the most important thing. Feeling comfortable that you can work with someone, that you can bring someone into your company. And not only maybe you, but your general counsel is going to feel comfortable with, your CEO is going to feel comfortable with, who can come in and can assist you in the event that you're breached or that you're compromised. I mentioned DHS and Secret Service, that's more of a US thing, but having some sort of a relationship with your law enforcement on a local, on a, a local basis, if you can, where you feel comfortable with them, that they know you and you know them, so that if they're gonna be a call that you're gonna make, that the first time they hear from you isn't when something bad happens. Privacy versus information sharing, you have to share information. I mean, you've got to share information. It's the only way that we're going to be able to make any headway against this threat. But the information has to be shared with respect for everyone's privacy. That's extremely important. So there are only certain things that you can share. But you need to lean as far forward as you can, if you will, when you share, so that the information gets out there and it benefits others. If you see something, you should be sharing it with other folks if you think it's going to help them in your sector or even in other industries. 
We talk about media and legal. Everything today, at least in the U.S., and maybe it's the same here, I would think it is, has some sort of legal ramification to it. So many of the companies we work with, the first phone call that we get is from the company attorney or the company general counsel because they're concerned about their reputation, they're concerned about what they tell their customers, and going forward what their legal obligation is going to be based on the fact that they've been hacked or they've been breached. So in many instances we're working with the legal department of these corporations and then the media. How does the media handle this stuff? No one wants it all over the front page of the newspaper that they were breached or they were compromised because it's the reputation of the company, the reputation of the CEO can be bad for business. Uh, stockholders aren't happy about it when it happens. And so figuring out some sort of plan to handle the, uh, the media aspect of it. In the United States, we actually work very closely when we go in and we do a breach, or when we investigate a breach, rather, excuse me. We actually work very closely. We have media teams or a media representative in each of our offices and we will normally work with the victim company and we treat the company as a victim to, uh, to address some of the media concerns. In the United States, and it may wear, very well be the same here, and I'm sure it is, and I'm sure some of you are in the same business, uh, secu cybersecurity firms. We work with a number of different cybersecurity firms. Oftentimes when we're on the ground and we're investigating a breach, we've got someone out there uh, from a cybersecurity firm who's employed by the company or on retainer with the company and they're working the breach as well, trying to do what they can to help remediate and advise the company as they move through the, um, the process. And then I mentioned tabletop exercises, the fact that you should really exercise or practice what happens if I get breached. What do I do? How do I respond? What are we going to do? What are our processes going to be? And how are we going to continue to run our business? And then this is contacting the FBI. I won't go into this, but the one thing I will say is that we have a 24 by 7 watch element, which is called our Psy Watch. So if you suspect a breach or a compromise, you can pick up the phone 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can contact us. And then I had mentioned about our, our field offices and how we have personnel throughout the United States and really throughout the world. And then we have an Internet Crime Complaint Center, which I will mention because it actually takes complaints from all over the world. Where we have people, you go to sell a car online, and uh, you have the car for sale and it's X amount of money and someone says, I'm going to buy it, I'm going to send you the money and what ends up happening is you never get the money, but they get the car. Or you try to buy a car online, you send money and you never get the car or you never hear from them. The Internet Crime Complaint Center takes complaints from people all over the world and actually has been very effective. We take thousands of complaints. Uh, from people who unfortunately have been defrauded on the internet. There's really nowhere for people to go who are victims of some of those lower level cyber crimes because the Bureau doesn't have, in the United States, we don't have the resources to work them. We have so many bigger crimes we have to work and we have certain thresholds that we need to meet. So this is a place where people can go who are victims of some of the lower level crimes and feel like um, they can get some sense of satisfaction and perhaps some investigation out of it. That's it. Okay, thank you.